And I turned to Nicole and I said, I, I need to find another uh, mission. I need to find more purpose. And she said, well, what do you want to do now? And I said, well, I want to do something really amazing. I want to inspire people. And I, and I don't just want to help the charity. We've got an amazing charity that I'll talk more about in a second, but I want to inspire people. And if we can inspire people to undertake their own transformation, and in doing so, identify their charity or their cause, we have this self-fueling engine of positivity, not only from the individual, but also for the community. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Life Edge podcast. I'm your host, Chris Staffel. So if you've listened to the podcast before, you know that we tend to interview a lot of educators and coaches, and the goal of that is to help you transform and become a better version of yourself. Well, we wanted to introduce a new seg segment into the podcast today called Keeping It Real, where we're going to talk with um, people who are just out impacting the community and um, doing, doing things that are really going to change some lives in maybe a different way. And so today I wanted to start it off with a bang and I have my friend Matt Devine here. Um, Matt, thanks for joining us. Thank you and thanks for having me and thank you for uh, helping me generate awareness around this wonderful cause we're uh, about to undertake. Yeah, so so I wanted to have Matt on because he is, he's been, he's about to go do something pretty awesome and he's been doing things that are awesome and he's gone through a major major transformation himself so um matt uh thanks for being here why don't you just tell just start off by telling the listeners just a little bit about who you are and kind of what what drives you well i'm uh i'm a person that's at a stage in their life where i think the the term midlife crisis uh suited me uh, perfectly. Uh, I found myself without purpose. Um, I was retired. At this point in my life, I was fairly fit. Of course, we know there's a huge transform transformational story behind all that. But I was on the couch one day and I, I, I was suffering from what I would consider as depression, um, which I find to be quite common in a lot of my, my colleagues today. And this whole thing started with me waking up one day and I was laying on the couch, bored, uh, with no zest for life. And I looked at my wife and I said, I'm going to run 300 kilometers or seven marathons back to back to the Canadian Rockies from a, a town called Jasper to another town called Canmore. And it, it goes right through the glacial ice fields. And within about two and a half, three months, I trained for that. I'd never, I'd run only one marathon. I'd never run an ultra marathon. Uh, but within three months, I prepared for it. And we raised $60,000 that went to a charity called the Rainbow Society of Alberta. And it helps kids with uh, chronic uh, illnesses. Mm -hmm. I survived. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we did the run. I, I won't lie. I was very beaten up by the end of it. I had uh, no toenails left. My, uh, mm. my feet and ankles were swollen. I suffered uh, significantly. I ran through a blizzard <clears throat> on one Jeez. of the days. Uh, but when I was done, I took a bit of time off and uh, the whisper started to come back. I started to hear that you have to do more. So that's sort of where we are today, just mm -hmm. about ready to do more. Before before we jump into where you're at today, let's let's go back even further. Let's talk a little about you've had a pretty awesome transformation, and and I want to dive into that a little bit more. So why don't you, why don't you tell us um, some some about that transformation? Um, doesn't have to be the Cliff Notes version, but yeah, we'll we'll start there, and then we'll dive into the seven and seven, and then we'll get into uh, uh, where you're headed today. Sure. So I was, uh, <clears throat> I was always an athlete when I was younger. I had a fairly normal childhood. My father, I would say, was an alcoholic. Um, and that's going to become more important as we get deeper into the mm. story. But I had a fairly happy childhood. Um, and as I uh, was going through this process of going through high school, heading towards university, I transitioned into... Um, sports like combat sports boxing and i had an option to go to the olympics 
Hmm. And um, in what sport, sport? In what sport were you? Could you go to the Olympics? Olympic boxing. Okay. I was offered a, an opportunity to try out, and I actually did go down for some uh, what they would call a box off in the U.S. Uh, Canada versus U.S. And I, it kind of reminded me how tough this sport was. And I saw all my friends heading towards university. Um, and I thought, you know, maybe that's the path I should take. And the reason why I say that is because that's a critical point in my life. Because when I went to university, I left the discipline of the sports uh, training behind. Mm -hmm. And of course, we all know what happens in university. Um, you meet people, uh, you become sort of an unrestricted adult. Uh, you have freedom, you have friends, you have opportunities to socialize. And I took to that lifestyle pretty hard. Um, and I would say at that point, I was like any other university kid. I was partying hard, I was drinking hard, um, but it felt very normal to me. Yeah. Where that started to change was when all my friends were starting to graduate and I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I sort of started to realize this wasn't fun anymore. I ended up getting kicked out of university twice because of my partying and my poor grades. I was just starting to decline rapidly. I managed to pull myself up uh, and sort of sprint to the finish line and get through university, which opened up the second door, which was to my career. I've always been a fairly social people's person, so I excelled at my career, but it opened up even more doors for socializing. Now it was part of my business routine. Um, the drinking accelerated, I started smoking, I started putting on weight, and to fast forward it, I became what I would consider a, a binge drinker, um, a smoker, but the, the scary part was I was almost 300 pounds. I went to the doctors, the doctors took a bunch of measurements, came into the room and said, you're about three to five years away from having a medical event that's going to be quite significant. Hmm. And what they were saying was, you're probably going to die. I had high blood pressure. I have a family of history of diabetes and strokes, etc. So they said, you're in some serious trouble and you need to change your life right now. How, how old were you at this time? Uh, probably my mid thirties. Okay. And that started my transition physically. So that was kind of my rock bottom. Everybody asks about the rock bottom. Um, that's, that was my wake up call and I started to get in, in, into shape. But it was kind of like I was working out so that I could justify the partying still. Mm. And I continued to party um, even though I was getting in shape. Uh, I was physically uh, transformed probably about five years later where I was feeling quite healthy, but the drinking and the smoking uh, were, were still, still an ongoing thing. And around mid forties, I realized like this was not just a physical thing. It was a mental thing as well. And you know, we have a crisis right now around mental illness, depression, etc. And I think I was experiencing that. And that was sort of my, my second rock bottom. I was a very successful business person and I ended up committing career suicide. Uh, I finally, my mind was so, so I was in so much turmoil. I went into work and the pressures and the interactions I was having triggered me. And I said, uh, I can't do this anymore. I felt I was living a lie. I wasn't being authentic to myself. And now I started the mental part of my transformation and I quit I walked out and that was the hmm. the last time I worked for over a year and that sort of led me towards what we'll talk about next which is the 300 yeah what what do you think were there warning signs throughout that 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 time period where or any kind of red flags for you where you just kind of like yeah I'm gonna ignore that or somebody had said something was because there's a process of right putting on the weight there's a process of moving into depression it's not necessarily I just wake up here and I wake up one day and now I'm 300 pounds I wake up one day and I'm severely depressed what do you think aided in that process of ending up there you know it's a good question I think the physical aspect of it is very clear it's embarrassing I was embarrassed mm -hmm. of myself you know 
people that hadn't seen me for five years would run into me on the street and I felt it. You know, I was this, I was a skinny young kid that was quite athletic and now I was this 275 pound man and I was embarrassed by it. And, and it's a really, it's a real easy eye opener when someone says, look, you're going to die, you know, mm. you're going to develop a cancer, you're going to develop diabetes, you're going to stroke out. The mental, the, the second rock bottom, the mental side, and I still suffer with it today, it's like an overwhelming feeling of gray on some days where you just can't breathe. You mm. can't function very well. And I think in today's society, we quickly rush towards the pill solution. But we as human beings now have a, a responsibility not only to ourselves, but to the larger community with all the things that we're dealing with to help each other. And happiness, <laughs> finding happiness requires fuel. It just doesn't happen by itself. Unless you're one of those lucky, blessed people that just wake up feeling, feeling good, you need fuel to, to ignite happiness. And, and that doesn't come without something like purpose. So for me, it was just, I, I was so desperate to make a change that um, I looked at the one thing I was good at, which was the endurance fitness. And I said, I'm going to do this for kids. And it, it didn't make the, the, the depression go away. It pushed it back. Hmm. It kept it at bay. And I think people who suffer from depression will say it never goes away. It's like alcoholism. You're always an alcoholic. I think depression exists within, you know, the majority of the population. I think uh, people that have the ability to push it back and keep it at bay are successful. And what I want to try to teach people is some strategies to help them, both physically and mentally, uh, especially on the mental side, to keep that depression at bay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what you said there about, like, it's our responsibility to help our communities is just so powerful. I think a lot of people think that the the community is there to help them. And in, in some ways it is, but you got to contribute to that community as well. Exactly. You know, when I saw my first counselor, <clears throat> at this point I was the CEO of a company. I was quite successful. And I, I reached out to this counselor. I never thought in my wildest dreams I, Matt Devine, would be talking to a counselor. And I say that just because I thought I had it all together. Mm -hmm. When I finally got desperate enough, um, this, this woman said something to me. She said, you know, happiness is made up of three elements. Relationships, accomplishments, and um, purpose. Or what's coming. Well, with depression, you all too often damage relationships. So mm -hmm. my relationships were suffering. The purpose that I once had no longer meant anything to me. And my accomplishments were, were becoming stale. So I was in this really bad place. And, and I needed to work on myself to make my relationships healthier. Mm -hmm. But I also had to define a new future. To, to, to find the purpose and those new accomplishments. And I think that's what's important for people to hear is that it, it, can, it has to be, a, it has to be a, a very much engaging process that you need to take yourself through. It, it's, al it's almost altruistic. You have to ask yourself, what do you want to be in version 2.0? What do you yep. want to be when you grow up? And, and then you start to develop that life plan to move you towards that. Yeah, and and that is so huge because that that's a something I keep just parroting, talking, saying constantly. I, I just had a, a podcast the other day with a with a life coach, and we got talking about some of the biggest struggles right now with um, the younger generation. And I have these conversations with them, and I'll ask them, well, "Where where do you want to be in a year? Where do you want to be in five years? Where do you want to be in ten years?" They don't even know what they want to do tomorrow. So there, there's no purpose for them. And so they're struggling, just like you said, when, when you don't have that purpose and then you don't have the relationships to help you drive you to, the, to a purpose, like it, there's no happiness. It's 
we're meant to be on this planet for a reason to have a purpose and without that purpose like you said there's just no happiness a hundred percent and for, for for everybody purpose is a different uh recipe mm -hmm. and i really get mad when i get uh compared to you know these motivational people because motivation to me is very fleeting it, it's mm -hmm. It's something you wake up to and you hear a quote and you go, I feel great. And then the reality of the gray slips back in. Your life still is what your life was before you heard that motivational quote. So it's really up to you to create your own inspiration and your own motivation. And I'm not going to yell and rant and rave at people to go <laughs> run 300 kilometers or cycle 13,000 <laughs> kilometers. What I am going to say is find your mountain and climb it and embrace the process of the climb because the destination is great but once you find purpose the process becomes addicting and that's that's really what makes this whole process tactical um, mm. I really don't like it when people give me advice that I can't break down into little tactical steps I'm a program manager by trade so I like to decompose the problem and I often tell people the only way to eat the elephant is one bite at a time. Yep. So start with small steps and we'll get you to that end state. But the important thing for everybody is what is the end state? And this is where we get into the conversation of transformation. And the best example I can give to people of transformation is the baby letting go of the table for the first time to take a step. Mm -hmm. Once that baby lets go, he or she may fall several times, but they'll get back up and try again. And once they start taking those steps, their world has changed. And they never revert back to using furniture to navigate around the room. They picked up a new capability that allows them to explore the universe in a completely different way. And this is the power of transformation, and this is what I want to try to give to people. That's that. That's such a great analogy. I don't know that I've heard it put that eloquently. So, so thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, why don't you then take us through your transformation and how you transitioned from being on the couch, depressed, um, yet physically fit and doing better, but still in in your mind just trapped. Yeah, and and I love the way you pose that question because. Uh, most people think transformation is physical. It's around fitness, and it's mm. not. Fitness is just one of those capabilities that you may need to um, you may need to create within yourself to get you to that end state that you're after. But more often than not, that is not transformation. It's mm. just a physical change. I was done the physical transformation. I was fit. But I was waking up every day, and I can't, I can't tell people. It was like there was an 800-pound weight on my back. I was going to a job that was paying me good money. I was working with great people, but I was so uninspired. And it was that day on the couch. You know, I was kind of desperate. And I, I heard those words that the counselor told me about finding purpose. And I asked myself, well, what are you good at? What do you love to do? And I thought, well, why don't I run? I'll run for a cause. And even though I don't have kids, there are children in my life that I absolutely adore. And I hate to see any child suffering. Mm. So I thought, well, why don't I run for children? And I turned to my wife and I said, I'm going to run 300 kilometers for children. We measured the distance from one side of the Rockies to the other, and it happened to be the distance of about seven marathons. And when I told people I was going to run seven marathons in seven days at my age, they said, you're crazy. And I started training that next day, and that, that's the interesting thing. What was getting me out of bed wasn't the running. It was the kids. Mm -hmm. That became the purpose. I was driven by that number that was going up. And I knew every $5,000 I raised went to fulfilling a dream of a, of a sick child. And every time another 5000 was raised, I said I just helped another child. And it's, it's, it became my purpose. And no matter how dark it got, one week I had to run seven half marathons. 
back to back in training, um, following my plan, and I hated it. I actually everybody says you must love running. Uh, I hate it. I probably will never run again. <laughs> but I, I got myself out of bed to run for these kids, and uh, that's that became my feel. That became my inspiration. And it, it, the interesting thing. We, we talked about it a moment ago. It's not motivation because motivation is fleeting. It goes away very quickly. Yep. It has to have that long-term lasting effect. And that's what these kids did. And you know what's interesting about this whole thing? A small team of people came together. I ran. My wife drove the support van. I had an amazing physiotherapist, Adam, uh, supporting me. Another gal named Steph who was there the entire way taking care of my blistered feet. And we raised that money and every cent of it went to that charity. We were lean and mean and we, we delivered this huge impact. And that's the power of transformation. And, and when people get involved in it, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah. And what I think is so great is, I mean, I want to get back to, I'm very curious what your wife said when you told her, hey, I'm going to run seven marathons in seven days. But when you have that vision and you start and you become disciplined enough to do the work to get there, the people that will support you. There, there's, there's thousands on thousands of people who want to support that kind of mission. It's, but you, have to, you had to go out and be disciplined enough to get up and train every day and do the things that needed to be done. And I think a lot of people miss that step. Yeah, I, I really wish, you know, I see people desperately suffering quietly I look at them and I and I get a sense I see people who are not healthy I see people who struggle day to day and some people are struggling mentally and maybe I don't know them but I get a feeling they're suffering and they're not they're not um, they're not living the best lives and they want to make changes and I really want to reach out and help these people but I I, it, I can't be intrusive and just walk up to them and say hey I want to help you but I can't stress enough that change accelerates change. And once you start, take one step, take 10 steps. I have a, a colleague, his name's Darcy. He's going to be riding with me for the first part of this ride. He says, movement is medicine. Movement and, 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 and uh, fitness won't solve all your problems, but I can tell you right now, it is a fundamental pillar to transformation. It's mm -hmm. not the only pillar, as I said earlier. It's fundamental. Move one step, move one step at a time. It is medicine, and I can't stress to people, um, the human body is capable of amazing things. I never would have thought 300 kilometers. And more so what I'm about to do. I, I would have no, no belief in myself to do that, but we can and we will. And if I hear one more person tell older people they should slow down, I will reach out and strangle them. <laughs> Speed up. <laughs> Speed up. Keep your body moving. Use it. One day we all have to shut down. Our knees need to be replaced. Our hips are going to have to be replaced. But there's no point in trying to conserve it. It's going to happen regardless. Get yep. out there and enjoy your body and leverage it. And it will bring you, or at least participate in the bringing to you of happiness. Yeah. And, and the whole, as people get older, they're supposed to slow down myth that we've been told. You got to work till you're 65 and then you can retire and lay on the couch and play golf. And I, I just, I was at a conversation last, last weekend um, with somebody who's, retired now and he was like man i you're gonna slow down and your body's gonna change and i was like well no because i'm not this isn't going to allow that to happen like yeah. this is in control of the rest of this my brain controls my body my body doesn't control my brain exactly. and i just i just saw a video of a it was a 94 year old man climbing uh the slanted rope wall at a, at a spartan race 94 years old, dude's still crushing a Spartan race where most yeah. people at 30 are like, oh, I'm too old for a Spartan race. Exactly. And I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, I get it a lot. I'll have a lot of people walk up to me in my gym and say, hey, are you that guy that's running or riding? Yep. You know, you really should slow down. And they're overweight. 
Yeah. Because they're telling me this. And I, I scratch my head and go, and, and here's the, the fundamental problem with where we're heading as a society. Uh, obesity, mental illness, all sorts of illnesses related to our um, metabolic uh, system, diabetes, cancers, stroke, heart disease, they're on the increase. Yeah. And on the back end, especially here in Canada, our healthcare system is becoming overwhelmed. Depression is on a rise, addiction is on the rise, suicide is on the rise. If we don't start promoting a change and lead by example, I believe we're going to hit a critical uh, mass where we're going to be in some serious trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you go in for that knee replacement, you're not going to be able to get it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I really believe we as a society now not only have to start taking care of ourselves, but we have to fuel our transformations through helping our communities. Hmm. I, I can't agree more. And I know for a lot of people, I, I talk to a lot of people and they're always like, well, I just don't want to do this or do that. And you had mentioned that like physical transformation is, is a key, but it's not the end all be all. And for me personally, I had like physical transformation was the start of the momentum that you were talking about the movement I had to start somewhere and at the time when I was overweight and unhappy in my job and miserable it's very similar um, I knew the only thing that I could do at that point was to get healthy and for us my wife and I that meant getting up at 315 every day for five days a week to go to the gym before we both had to go off to work because 3.15 in the morning was the only time we could do it. Now that period only lasted six months and it sucked, like it was miserable. But where we are today, like I'm so happy I put in that time and effort and energy to get up when everyone, even at that time I was still in my 20s and people are like, you need to slow down, same thing. You're too, the, you, your body can't handle this, your body can't. And I'm sure you get that all the time with the running and the cycling. Like yeah. you're pushing your body too hard. You're going to break your body. And Yeah, and you, you said something really important there. The idea of getting up at 3.15. Some people will just roll their eyes and go, you are crazy. But what people don't understand is that happiness, happiness is the field of transformation. And once you get fueled, through that happiness, that, that purpose, the accomplishment, your relationships that you're building, getting out of bed becomes easier. And, mm -hmm. and that's the problem. Most people who are not physically fit are also mentally depressed. They don't feel good about themselves. So it's very difficult for them to roll out of bed. But once you start, that fuel starts to accelerate it. And you know, I've got a couple of people I follow and that have followed me they joined me on my 300 kilometer run and they said, I just want to run 5K. I just want to run 10K. Now I follow them on Instagram and they're doing half marathons, working their way up to a marathon. So mm -hmm. it's that first roll out of bed at 315 and you're going to get some spark of happiness. And happiness is an incredible accelerant. It's like, I feel good about this. They call it the runner's high for a reason. If you could bottle that, you know, and, and keep that uh, on standby and take a big swig when you needed it, it it'd be an incredible seller. Mm -hmm. So when you were here, just to switch gears a little bit, when you were running, when you were actually running the, the marathons, was there a time where you're like, I don't know that I can do this or I'm done? And what got you through it? Yeah, the, uh, there's some pictures on Instagram of feet that look like they should be amputated. But, um, you know, there, there is a, uh, a lot of people have asked me, so what was it like? There's, there's a video of me running through awful conditions and I'm, I'm, I'm at the peak of the Columbia ice fields and there's a uh, plow operator clearing this mountain pass and I'm looking up at him and what people don't know is he was telling me to turn around, go back. We are shutting the roads down, the weather was that bad. So we were up in the mountains running. Um, 
and on average I'd be running between five and seven hours a day depending on the elevation I would have to climb and I got into the van and I said to the, the, the group, I said, I don't think I can do this. I think this was day three or day four. I said, I don't think I can do this, guys. This is horrible. But like I said earlier, it, I, I'd say, well, meet me up at eight, eight kilometers or, or, or drive up five kilometers and have a hot bowl of soup ready for me or a mm. bag of potato chips or something at that point, I could eat whatever I wanted. Yeah. I was probably burning three or four cal thousand calories a day. And I'd run that 5K. And then I'd say, okay, guys, I'm going to go from here, 10K, meet me up uh, up, the, up the road, and I'll have a, a, a Diet Coke or a cup of coffee or something like that. And I literally ate the elephant one bite at a time. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how I did it. And every day... I checked off, I said, I, I got another day done. And I think that's that's what I'll stress to people is decompose it. Don't look at this as a 100 pound weight loss. Don't look on it as a, a 10K. Look on it as one day getting up, going to the gym and initiating that transformation. And the feedback you'll get will accelerate the process. Yeah, and, and that's so important that eat the elephant one bite at a time because you tell people like we talked about er earlier is have a purpose well when you tell somebody oh i'm gonna run seven marathons in seven days now i'm overwhelmed and yeah. it's like well no just it's for you one one climb one 5k at a time or one mile at a time like that's all it is that's all you focus on um losing weight i'm getting up i'm going to the all i got to do is go today I'll worry about tomorrow or tomorrow. I just need to get today done. And too many people allow that that overwhelm to take over and, and to keep them stuck. I agree. And, you know, I've been called an endurance athlete a couple of times, and I look at that, uh, that individual or I hear that and I go, that's not me. I am not an endurance athlete. What I am is a determined person who's tapped into the power of the human spirit, hmm. something we all have. And for other people, tapping into the human spirit could be helping orphans. It could be donating their time to charity. It could be, you know, working a food bank. It could be anything. But the human spirit is amazing. And I think once you find a way to tap into it, you can, you can harness it. And you can accomplish great things. I don't read a book and I don't want to mention the authors, but there are some authors out there that talk about running the, the, the ultra marathons through blistering heat, um, uh, cycling from point A to point B in record time. And it's truly uh, climbing Everest and it's truly stories of, you know, athleticism. Mm. I don't, I don't promote that. <laughs> To anybody because it to your point it's not it doesn't resonate with people mm -hmm. you just have to to realize that it's within you to take that first step and set your goal small uh begin to move forward and again it will start to accelerate and you'll start to get more uh feedback uh, positive feedback from that whole process and uh, embrace the process because running the 10k is nothing it's the process of getting there. To run 10K, you probably trained three, 400K. That, mm -hmm. That's amazing. And if you embrace the process, you've already accomplished your goal. Yep. And, and I like, too, how you said it's not, you don't want to promote it as a feat of athleticism because then it becomes, this is just something Matt did because Matt, Matt has this extra trait or this extra skill, and that's not the case. So... That's so important to point out. Um, yeah. And there's, there's a person who knows me. They said, you know, this person will run till they'll drop. And, and again, it's one of those things where some people have this determination that takes them past the red line and others quit before the red line. But again, I don't believe that's, that's something that's within your DNA. I think that's mental. And I, I think that we can all become tougher. I think we can all run further. I think we can all run faster than we believe we can. And it's just the process of getting there. Mm -hmm. 
So now let's dive into where you're headed next. You, you, yeah. you, we, we've covered a lot of the story. What, what's your purpose now? Where are you headed now? So when I finished the 300K, um, and here's, here's evidence <laughs> about purpose and, and how dramatic it can be. After I was finished the 300K, of course I had to recover. I went back to my home city. I got back into my house and the gray started to creep back in. Hmm. That's how quickly, if you let the beast come back, it will. And I turned to Nicole and I said, I, I need to find another uh, mission. I need to find more purpose. And she said, well, what do you want to do now? And I said, well, I want to do something really amazing. I want to inspire people. And I, and I don't just want to help the charity. We've got an amazing charity that I'll talk more about in a second, but I want to inspire people. And if we can inspire people to undertake their own transformation and in doing so identify their charity or their cause, mm -hmm. we have this self fueling engine of positivity, not only from the individual, but also for the community. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to start in Halifax, Canada on May 20th. I'm going to cycle all the way across Canada to uh, Victoria. And then we're going to head north to the uh, White Horse and, uh, uh, sorry, Northwest Territories in the Yukon. And then I'll circle back and finish in Edmonton, Alberta. It's a total distance of about 13,000 plus kilometers. Um, over 100 days of cycling. I'll be cycling on average about 150 kilometers a day for 100 days with about five or six rest days built in. Um, and along the way, we want to bring people into the Peloton. We want them to find their own reason to start the transformation. We want to inspire people to get on a bike or even to, to come around, <laughs> to run alongside us. But we want to inspire people to join this and we want to create this unstoppable uh, movement. We're calling it a whisper to a roar because it started with mm. one individual talking to another. By the time I finish in Edmonton, Alberta, I want this to be a very loud conversation of change and positivity. Wow, that's that's so awesome. And, and we want to help you turn this thing from a, ris a whisper to a war, so a roar. So where can people where can people go if they want to see see the route that you have planned so they can support you? So there's two places to go for information. The first one is the rideforchange.ca. Um, the title of the event is called the Quick Card Ride for Change, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the people helping us because uh, there's another important aspect to all of this, and it's community leadership. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, quick, uh, quick card ride for change ha now has a website called rideforchange.ca, and the other place to go for information is Divine Transformation on Instagram. Um, I talk about my training. I talk about event updates. On the web page, there's route information. There's a, con a way to contact us. There's the donation page, etc. So go there, and you'll find out all the information. And if you want more frequent updates go to Divine Transformation on Instagram, where you see a lot of the fun <laughs> and, the, and the ugly parts of this <laughs> preparation. It's not all fun. <laughs> Five, six hours of riding uh, on a fixed trainer in my basement um, because it's winter here. So hmm. training for this event is very difficult. Well, being someone who used to be a cyclist, training on a fixed trainer for five hours in a basement is the most miserable thing you could possibly do. Yeah, and uh, uh, I've got some amazing people. We have we have Alex Stida. He's the first uh, North American man to win a yellow uh, or to wear the yellow in the in the Tour de France. That's cool. Uh, I have a lot of people giving me input and trying to get me to that start line. And uh, right now I'm dealing with the pain and uh, the mantle part. I've got saddle sores, as you can imagine. Yep. I've got the mantle difficulties. And believe it or not, I'm talking to you right now with COVID. So I'm, I'm suffering. <laughs> but we're still going to go and ride this race no matter <laughs> what. That's, that's amazing, Matt. Uh, and I can, I'm a, I can attest to the work you've been putting in. I've been following you for a while. And I'm like, 
this guy is grinding right now. Um, yeah. For the last few months, I've been watching you just grind it out. So, uh, what was? Who are some of the other people you had mentioned? That I want to get into the charity that you're supporting too. But who are some of the other people you had mentioned in the community and stuff that are helping you out? And the reason why I want to talk these people typically don't want attention um, and they don't want promotion. But um, here's what I'll say about people who sponsor me. Uh, I believe as a leader, uh, as a previous CEO of an organization, we need to give back to our communities. Mm -hmm. um, and the gentleman I'll use right now, his name is Lyle Best. Uh, he's the uh, owner of the company Quick Card Benefits, and, and they're our title sponsor. And I asked him uh, in an interview one day, why are you, why are you, why did you fall in love with this um, kind of mission we're on? And I loved his response. He said, Matt, a healthy community, healthy business, healthy employees. Hmm. And I thought, what an amazing way to look at that. If we could all get, if we get all as leaders, just have a little bit of that in our, in our daily thought, I think we could do so much more for our society. And he put his, his money, he put his actions behind his words. He's, he's elevated this uh, event so significantly and I, I, I can't stress enough we call him the guardian angel um, he's gonna put a lot of bikes on kit or kids on bikes because of this and, and that's what this charity does that we're riding for but he stood right up there's others uh, production 71 they make our videos a lot of our our more professional videos uh, Kieran's a friend of mine his child was served by the charity that we're riding for and it, it, we didn't even know that when this whole relationship begun, but this is how tight our community is. Um, and there's many more, they're all listed on the website, but I can't stress enough. If you are part of a business or you own a business or you're a leader in the community, step up, be part of this amazing journey or find another journey that is, you're passionate about and get behind it. Mm -hmm. We can do so much for our community. Yeah, 100%. And and two, for businesses, like it's a tax deduction. Those donations, they become so you're benefiting the community and you get to benefit your business at the same time. So it becomes a win win yeah. for a lot of businesses. Well, I also believe that uh, successful people like Lyle or, or, or Kieran or any of these other people that are helping me, this fuels them. I mean, yeah. this, these people are very successful. He, he or, or any of the other people I mentioned don't need a lot more. They're doing really well, mm. but it fuels them. They, they, they feel the same power I feel when I complete a ride or I go out and see the kids we're going to be helping. I get motivated by this. And I think they feel the same thing because they're doing something that gives them a higher level of purpose and, mm -hmm. and inspires change. So I really applaud leaders who step up and do these things. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. So tell us a little bit about the, the charity that you're writing for, because I think this is pretty awesome. Yeah, so these little people um, have uh, some form of disability that creates barriers for them to hop on a bike. Now that in itself seems uh, something that uh, is, may, may seem a little insignificant, but what people don't understand about getting on that bike, it's like the baby letting go of the table it transforms these kids and when I speak to the parents and I speak to the occupational therapists they'll say that it, 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 it starts change that will resonate throughout the rest of their lives mm -hmm. we're removing barriers that puts uh, that stops kids from getting on bikes and once they're on these bikes the worlds change this you can see the smile some of them can't speak some of them don't have um, a way to communicate but you see it you'll see some of the videos I post on my Instagram these little children get on bikes and their expression changes and it starts a positive uh, rippling effect of change that will last throughout their life it gives them freedom it gives them independence and it brings them joy and it makes them physically stronger and more capable individuals and I think that's a critical thing that we need to do as a society is stand these these children up and make them the, the best versions of themselves that we can. 100%. And I, I think a lot of us, 
look at like, well, you're just you're helping little kids ride bicycles. That's cool. But I, I think that's because we take our health for granted so often that yeah. to us, like riding a bicycle, yeah, it's fun, whatever. But these kids, like, to them, riding a bicycle is you running seven marathons in seven days. Like that, that's that's the size of the goal, the dream for them because it's not just. Hey, I can just get on and ride a bike. Like some of these bikes that they have to be heavily modified for the kid to be able to use it. And it's, it's a big deal. Like it changes their world. Um, and I don't think a lot of people realize that I, for me personally, my, my mom, uh, works for a school. She works with special needs kids and I see the struggles that these kids have and I've seen it for a while. And I think that's part of what impacted me so much about what you're doing too, is it just, you're changing these kids' lives and, and it's pretty amazing. Yeah, and I'll tell you a story that, that moved me. One Saturday, I had just done a five and a half hour ride in the basement. I started at 5 a.m., I ended at 10.30 a.m. And I turned to Nicole and I said, now we have to go visit these kids. And I hadn't, I haven't had a lot of exposure to kids that are not communicative, that, that mm. have limited capabilities in that space. And for a person going into that environment for the first time, you're a little nervous. I was a little bit uncomfortable. How do I interact with these kids? So I was tired. I was a bit grumpy. I was a little bit nervous about having to meet these kids and their families for the first mm. time. And I remember walking in, and, and as I said, you can see the videos. It was like somebody shot uh, a boost of adrenaline into my system. I fell in love with these kids. Um, I got down on my knees so that I could look at them straight in the eye. I was so comfortable interacting with them. Mm. But the moment that really hit home for me was when a, a, a mother of a child who was in the military, she came to me and she said, you know, when, when the system to book these bikes goes live, I'm up at four in the morning, three in the morning, trying to reserve the bike for my child. And I said, that's amazing. And she said, and the important thing to notice is that without this bike, I can't go outside with my child. I can't interact in a way with my child that would be considered normal. I can't take the child for a, for a run with the bike, I can go out and I can run and we can walk and we can go and explore because this child has the bike and they become a bit more independent. And for me, it's not just the child now that's benefiting, it's the parents. And these bikes on average cost between 5000 and up. And, uh, you know, to your point, it's a team of local people donating their time to build and customize these bikes. And in my mind... <laughs> I can go cycle 13,000 kilometers. <laughs> that's the easy part. It's, it's yeah. putting these kids on the bikes that counts. Wow. That's, yeah. Um, where do people go to, I know we talked about it, but just again, tell people where they go to go to help support you, to help donate um, everything that they can do. And what do you need right now? Well, the good news is uh, we've got most of our, our sponsorship needs in place. We're just shy. Uh, we have a few more sponsorship uh, spots available. We have a van that will be going across Canada. We're going to have the sponsors' logos on it. They're obviously going to be on our, our web page. There'll be certain sponsors on the riding kit. But uh, we have a few more spots open. So if you're an organization or you know an organization that wants to be uh, part of this journey and be promoted doing this awesome thing, uh, reach out to us. Uh, our con to contact us, just again, go to rideforchange.ca. Um, but once the sponsorship uh, spots close down and we've, we've got no more room, it's all about raising money for these kids. And every dollar just like every kilometer I'm going to ride is going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really what we want to do. I, I raised $60,000 the first time in seven days while I'm cycling, 
you know, uh, for a hundred days. So I want to, I want to see that at least double, triple, you know, like I, I really want to raise the roof off of this charity and I want to see a lot of smiling kids riding these bikes. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to make sure to put, um, links in, in the video, but I'll we'll also drop links down below in the show notes for, um, the website as well as your Instagram. And then, uh, we're going to just share this with everybody that we possibly can. So uh, we're going to help out as, as, as much as we possibly can. And then as we start to wrap up, uh, we, you've left a lot of lessons for the, uh, the audience, but what, what do you feel is the more, most important lesson that you've learned through just everything you've gone through that you really want the audience to hear? You know, it, it's, it start, just start take that first step um you know what i will talk a little bit maybe later in another session i talked about the framework to transform the first mm -hmm. step in transformation is blocking out all noise and it's listening to the silence and just listen to that silence and, and try to identify the signal because the signal quite often defines the person you want to become. It, it'll, it'll tell you what your end state or that first intermediate end state looks like. Identify that person you want to become and start. Take the first step. Reach out to me or reach out to the uh, rideforchange.ca webpage and say, look, I want to start my own transformation. And I would love to share with you and all of your, uh, your uh, viewers a framework that I feel can help uh, create a map for them to undertake their own transformation. But find the stillness, listen to the signal, determine that end state, and start. Amazing. Matt, I, I can't thank you enough for, for coming on the show today. And uh, like I said, we're going to do everything we can to help promote you. Um, everyone, go follow Matt. Um, give us your Instagram handle again one more time. Divine Transformation, one word, and divine is D-E, not D-I. Divine Transformation on Instagram. Go follow him. If you can't find him, just go to the Life Edge page search our followers because we're, we're following Matt. Um, we're supporting him. You'll see uh, us reposting his stuff. Uh, just go support what he's doing and go support this charity because it's, it's a pretty awesome cause and, and uh, these kids deserve it. So, I appreciate um, it. If, if you like this episode, please, please like and subscribe, but ultimately just share it with people. Let's, let's help, help us spread the word and, and get the word out about what Matt's doing. Um, we have, it looks like, two more months now till till you're about to start your journey i hope that you get healthy and and just crush this thing yeah i'm uh, i'm looking forward and i just want to thank you because it's folks like you that uh you know when you look across the landscape of instagram and and other um content creators i uh i really appreciate those authentic people that create meaningful content that help people and uh there's a lot of bad stuff out there and I just want to, you know, remind everybody, look for good sources like uh, yours. I appreciate it. You're, uh, you're a hero to the kids, to the community. And uh, I look forward to continuing our conversation as we go forward. Yes. Well, thank you so much. And um, just again, good luck. And, uh, and we'll, we're definitely going to get you on um, afterwards to see how things went. But also, let, let's, we'll have you on again and talk about your... Uh, transformation framework. So thanks again, Matt. Okay. Talk soon.